Hello, uh, this is Josh Carr at The Real Angle. Uh, today, we are speaking with uh, Diego Hurtado. Uh, I pronounced your last name correctly, right? Very, very well. I want to make sure I get it. You at got Navio it. Consulting, uh, pr principal at Navio. And uh, today, we're going to talk about fund management and raising funds and all kinds of other good subjects like that. Uh, Diego, Diego, how are you doing today? Doing well. Doing well. Thanks for having me, Josh. Thanks for joining. Always, always good to uh, expand the conversation. So uh, let's start with the basics. What does Navio do? Sure. So Navio Consulting was born, you know, about five to six years ago. Uh, it's a company that is based out of the state of Florida, which is where I live. And, uh, you know, what Navio Consulting does specifically is we help small to medium sized developers, uh, investors, private equity people that want to take take the company to the next level. So we help them build and set up real estate investment funds. And then once they're all set up, I help them manage it, right? So, okay. yeah, so that's, I mean, in essence, that, that's what it is. It, this is, you know, success, my clients are successful people. I've been sure. doing really well, right? They made money, they made mistakes, but, you know, they're, they're successful and they know that at some point, if they want to do bigger and better things, they have to get into building a fund. Right. They need to professionalize. No. Exactly. And so I guess with, when you're working with these people, I mean, they're they're small to medium sized developers. Um, I know we were chatting briefly before we got on the call that you're based in Florida. Um, most of the people you're working with, are they in a specific region and a specific product type? Where have you seen the most activity? So, the, so I have clients from all around the country, really. I stick with the United States, but I, you know, I have clients from, you know, all the way from the East Coast to the to the West Coast, uh, you know, very diverse type of people. Uh, it's typically, like I said, you know, small to medium sized developers that uh, have small teams and they can really justify a full time fund manager. Right. Uh, but they know they have to take that step. So that's that's where I come in. And as far as the asset class, if you will. Right. I typically uh, typically stay within the um, the multifamily world. Right. So most of my clients either are, you know, successful flippers, right? They've, done, they've been doing fix and flips for a while, or they've tried, you know, a small multifamily um, and they want to get into bigger assets. So my my background really, you know, before I started Navio Consulting was in property management and asset management in the multifamily world. And so I know that side of things really well. And, and so, you know, um, when, when I engage with clients, that's typically where we end up going. We build funds to buy multifamily. Um, and so, you know, that's when it comes to asset classes, that's typically what we do. So when they're coming to you, I mean, are they, I mean, they probably already have investors they're working with. They've got a book of clients. Are they really looking to you more for the capital raising side or like what, what's the, what's the, what's the part that you're filling the hole for, I guess? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. That, that comes up all the time. So I usually, um, I, you know, I come up with a, with a, with an analogy, right. With a metaphor to explain this to people, um, you know, a symphony, right. If you go to a symphony, I love classic music, you go to a symphony and you have all sorts of instruments, right. You got right. your, your clarinet, your violins, your, your piano. Right. And so, so those, those instruments are like, you know, in, in our world, it's, you know, you got your, your people that raise capital for the fund. Then you got the, the accounting department that you have the acquisitions department that looks for deals. Then you have the underwriting department that analyzes the deals. And then you have the asset management department. Right. And so, right. and so where I come in is I'm sort of like the, the orchestra director, right. I'm the only one that doesn't play any instrument and yet make sure that everyone you know, plays in, in unison. So that's where I come in. I don't really get involved in any specific side, but I make sure that one, we have the right team in place and two, that they all work together. The one portion, you know, uh, which I, you know, I, I, I don't really get involved is raising the capital, right? Um, I do help with strategizing on how to get there and we come up with a, with a strategy, but as far as actually going out there and raising the capital, you know, right. we usually have someone else doing that. Got it. Yeah. And I imagine that also gets into regulatory conversations about like exactly, exactly. dealers and all that kind of jazz. 
Yeah, you need to, to be licensed to get paid. And so, I, you know, that uh, that's sense. something that I don't deal with. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So um, let's talk about, I guess, what the typical fund structure looks like for these people. I mean, imagine they're coming to you. They've already done deals, obviously. I imagine some of the deals maybe they've raised some investors for, some they've done themselves. What kind of, like, what's the most typical structure that these people are using that, you know, size of funds, that, that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. So, so um, you know, I'll I'll backtrack a little. I I love teaching. I love coaching. So, you know, uh, allow me allow me to to do that here mm-hmm. for for mm-hmm. a second. Especially, Please. you know, we have some, someone in the audience that maybe is not as sophisticated in this field, but they're trying to get into it. So, I find it typically useful to to educate a little bit. And, and I sure. try to just with my clients, I try to be as simple as mm-hmm. I can explain. And I use a lot of analogies because people appreciate that, right? So, so I'll do it very simple. So um, most of my clients, like you said, Josh, they, they come from a place of, you know, hey, we, we've invested before. Typically, they've used their own money uh, or family's money, right? Sure. They typically have never raised capital from somebody else, mm-hmm. right? And so, and so what, what typically happens is, we, you know, we come in and, and, of course, this is all real estate. Right. You know, we're not investing. No, these funds are, you know, only real estate. So so the first thing that I explained to them is like, look, you know, when you build a fund and you try to raise capital from, you know, strangers. Right. Um, a lot of things get involved. For one, mm-hmm. you're supposed to register your fund. Right. You have to register your fund with the SEC unless you adhere to an exception. Right. The mm-hmm. SEC realizes that in order to incentivize the smaller guys, the smaller people to actually build a fund, they have to make it a little easier for them. If you were to register with the SEC, it's going to cost you a lot of time and money to do that. So a lot of smaller players would not be able to afford it. So they have all these sort of exceptions, right? right. And depending on which, on, on which direction you want to go, you're going to have to go after one exception or the other. Um, so it all comes down to the client. Now, to answer your question directly, what's the, the common, right, the most typical structure of a fund? Typically, we uh, we go after Regulation D, right? Yeah. Regulation D, Rule Five of Six. You know, it's, it's very well known in the industry. Uh, under under that, you have different options, and the most typical one is the one where we set up we set up a fund where you can actually advertise. The fund, right? So you have a you have an offering, and you can actually advertise it, you know, as much as you want. Uh, you have to follow certain requirements to make sure you adhere to that exception. And as long as you uh, register, you know, with Form D, as long, as long as you register your fund under that exemption and you follow the rules, then you should be okay. So in our case, you know, that's uh, Rule Five Hundred Six C, right, which allows you to actually market your offering as long as you have accredited investors, right? Right, which is a whole different conversation about accreditation, how to accredit. Yeah, and for those of you out there on the internet, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of documentation about this. You can go down quite some rabbit holes. Uh, I had someone on, uh, I had the uh, chief investment officer for CrowdStreet on uh, a few episodes ago, and CrowdStreet, you know, they're, everyone thinks of them as crowdfunding. And he's like, well, technically, not to paraphrase him, but he's like, well, technically, we're not crowdfunding. Like, crowdfunding is a separate law. Like, but, you know, and that's the problem. It's like people talk about things in a colloquial way. Oh, you do this. But then it's like, yeah, but regulatorily, what's the actual sentence? Like, what is the thing, you know? Exactly. Uh, and and I and that said, in all this, I'm not an attorney, right? I mean, I just, well, I, I, I just talk... Funny. It's you know. funny that you mentioned that because it happens all the time. I just met, so just a few weeks ago, I'll give you another sure. example of, of, of exactly what you're saying. So a few weeks ago, I have a meeting with uh, these two gentlemen, you know, uh, small developers. They've been very successful, you know, fairly wealthy. And they approached me for the same reason. Hey, we realized that, you know, we, we, we want to do better things and, and we sure. need to raise capital. We need to set up a fund. Uh, you know, this is how we've been doing until now. What do you think? And I say, well, ha- have you have you registered? Like, you know, have have you know what exception? Sure. Are you what using? are you doing? Yeah. What yeah. are you doing? You know? And they're like, well, uh, no, we're just raising money from friends and family, and yeah, that's it. I'm like, well, okay, so let's okay, so like, hold on, so just just so you know, that's that's okay, but this is you know this is what you got to do because at the end of the day, you're selling securities, and the first reaction is like, no, no, we're not selling securities. I'm like, 
listen, <laughs> listen, if you're taking people's money, <laughs> right, right, right? Yeah. and you use and an investment contract, which, which can be a promissory note, and these investors depend on you to make some passive uh, income, right, a profit from you, you are selling a security. Then you're in so, securities. No, and it is funny. I mean, the yeah. SEC basically takes the position of you're security unless we tell you you're not a security, you know, <laughs> exactly. which... Which means, I guess, everything's a security. You know, I open a restaurant and my brother invests in it. It's a security. Like, you know, and then you go, no, no, no. Well, that's ridiculous. So, yeah, and that, and that's fair enough. I mean, the SEC, they gave themselves a very broad mandate. Uh, I remember someone years ago said to me, uh, but, you know, don't forget there is the good deal exemption exception. And I said, what's that? He said, well, if you make everyone money, then no one complains. <laughs> and that has always stuck with me. There's the good deal exemption, you know, and it is, it is true. All of this documentation, usually you only really dig into it when like the deal loses everyone money and then everyone sues everyone. So exactly. Yeah, so. You, you prepare for the worst. Now, hopefully that never happens, but is that one time that if it does happen, Mm -hmm. You can lose. You can lose all the profits from. No, understood, understood. So, so you're dealing with these people who are looking to do bigger stuff. So, why are they doing a fund? Big picture, like why do a fund? Why not just keep raising money, deal by deal by deal? Yeah. So when so there is, you know, I'm back to to coaching a little bit, right? Yeah, please. And another misconception in the industry, and you know, I'm surprised that many people don't know the difference between a syndication and a fund. Right. Uh -huh. uh, and so and so, you know, going back to your question, when you're doing uh, when you're raising capital for a pre identified property, that's a syndication. Right. Right. When when you are uh, raising capital under a set of investment criteria, that's a fund. Right. So in a syndication, you know, you invest in a, in a specific property that you close it and then you move on to the next one. That's okay for smaller assets, right? For smaller transactions. But if you're trying to do something much bigger and much better, and you're trying to raise, you know, you know, a, a bigger amount of capital, a fund typically becomes the easier structure, right? right? right. And and uh, and typically, when you get into these, it's not just to invest in one asset. Typically, you want to keep going in the future and, and reinvest and become bigger and better. It's not typically for one type of for one transaction, but you know, for the future. And so the best way to go about it is to actually build a fund that can support, you know, uh, 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 that type of business. Right. And, and I've done syndications myself. So I do appreciate gotcha. the fact that you do one at a time and, you know, and, and there's a plus and a minus to it. I mean, having so having raised money for my own deals, you know, the blessing of doing a syndication is you can actually point to the transaction. You can point to the building. You say, if you give me your money, we are buying that building. And that's <laughs> powerful as someone who raises right. money. Whereas right. with funds, you're saying, I have a vision, I have an idea, I have a track record, I, there's me, but you can't usually say, and here's this building, you know? I mean, right. now that said, I have seen cases where someone says, well, we're gonna raise a fund and we'll roll a couple existing buildings into it, or we're negotiating a deal for this one thing or something like that. But yeah, I, it always comes back to at the end of the day, in my experience anyway, What's your track record? What's your experience? Do you have a proven success at doing whatever the heck this strategy is? Because uh, otherwise, you know, why would anyone give you money? Exactly. No, that you are right on on the point, and and you know, it's interesting that that you mentioned that because um, you know, if track record is everything, right? You got to prove that that you know that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, it, you know, it, it definitely comes down to that. Now, as if on a fund level, um, it's true. You can't point to a specific property. But at the same time, the, you know, the other side of the coin is you got a lot of investors that don't really care about the property. They just care about the numbers. Right. So if you can sure. provide, you know, a model where you say, OK, this is what I'm getting in return. And there's no way that I'm going to get that return if I invest my money elsewhere, mm -hmm. then let's do it. It, no, right. and, I, and I get that. I'm just saying the fun thing I've always enjoyed about syndications is you can actually like bring it up yeah. on Google Maps and you can say agree, that building, that building we're buying. And people That's, yeah. quickly That's are like, got it. Like you don't, it's it's easier to explain, you know, yes. you don't really need yeah. a slide deck. You can say, here's the building, here's some numbers. Does it's this true. sound good? It's a very, it's, a, it's in my experience anyway, it's a quicker decision. Um, yes. They, they know if yeah. they're in or out. 
So, yeah, exactly. so let's talk about, so you're raising a fund for these people. And so these people come to you and say, I want to raise a fund. I need some guidance. You're acting as a coach. You're pulling together the different resources. I imagine, you know, bringing in an attorney, bringing in the different parties you need to actually go make this. And then let's say now the fund gets launched and they're successful, which is fantastic. Are you still involved at that point? What 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 ongoing involvement do you have in the fund once the thing's up and running? Yeah, sure. So typically I do stay involved, uh, you know, because when you set up a fund, uh, it's a very it's a very emotional transaction for a lot of uh, developers. You know, sure. it's the first fund. You know, it means a lot to them. And, and when you help them throughout and I hold their hand, I educate them at the same time so they feel more comfortable about the decisions they're making, mm-hmm, you know, they, mm-hmm. you tend to, to bond with them. And so at that point, it makes sense for them to, to keep me, right, to continue uh, to have this engagement with me. So I typically end up staying uh, managing the fund. And, um, you know, after, after we set it up, um, that's really when the work begins. You know, that's, you know, that's how I put it. You know, that's when you start to uh, having to figure out how to raise the capital, right? So you have to come up with with a strategy. How, how are we going to, where are we going to find that capital? Then you start working with your marketing team if you can actually market the security, right? right then right, you start right, right, right. recruiting, you start interviewing broker dealers if that's the way you, you're going, right? Uh, once you have the capital coming in, at the same time, you you know, you're, you're, you're building all, all, all your docs, all the necessary docs, yeah, you know, whether it's the private placement memorandum or, or whatever that is. Um, and at the same time, you're working with the acquisitions team to go find deals, right? right. Um, hopefully they've done that homework before, right? But um, but you got to work with, it, with them to, to find the deal, whether it's more homes to do the flips, whether it's more multifamily, wh- whatever that is. And, and, uh, and I serve as sort of a... a, a um, a, you know, it's a support, uh, a, a soundboard to underwriting as well, so, you know, because I've done quite a bit of underwriting in my, in my past to understand so, if that deal fits fits the model. So let me ask a couple targeted questions because I'm curious. So for the funds that you've gotten up and off the ground here, like what's the typical size, for example? Like what what's the, I mean, they're closed end funds. I imagine they have a limited life because Correct. that's probably what you're doing. Um, what's like, what's like the sweet spot do you find with these things for a first time fund? Sure. I've done anywhere between 5 million to 50 million in okay. capital raising for the first fund being, right. you know, closer to the 50 million is typically the sweet spot, especially right. if we get into multifamily. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And then the lifespan of these things, what are they like eight years? What are they? I was going to say five to seven. Okay. Uh, okay. you know, uh, yes. And then, and then as you know, once you, once you, exit right you got to keep the fund for an extra year or two because there's a lot of other stuff that goes on after the closing so yeah. but so, yeah more or less that that amount closing of final transactions final tax returns there's always exactly stuff. yeah exactly no, i get you i get you and then i imagine from a structure if these are little funds you know there's an asset management fee that they're collecting are they also getting like deal fees like acquisition fees disposition fees and imagine as much right yes exactly i you know i i um this is the part that developers love the most when we talk about fees that they can sure. earn right so i so i have i have a, a complete list of different fees that they can charge and typically it goes from anywhere between one percent and three percent no matter what fee you're talking about right um right. It, it, now what i do tell them is look you know, you got to be fair because at the end of the day, the fees that you're going to charge goes along our marketing piece. Right? Sure. We're trying to convince people to invest with, with you. You have to make it easier. You have to remember you're competing with other funds. So the more that you charge, the less likely it is for someone to invest with you. But you got to you got you to gotta be paid fairly to make sure that you're invested in the deal. So it's one of those negotiations that I got to bring them down to planet earth to make sure that they understand that we are competing with other people. Sure. Uh, while at the same time, making sure that this is a, a financially viable fund for everyone. Also just to chime in from my experience for whatever it's mm-hmm. worth, you know, on the bigger funds, sort of the much bigger funds, you don't see as much in the way of deal fees, because if you're getting one and a half percent on a billion dollars, you're making so much in management fees anyway, that worrying about, oh, I get a mortgage brokerage fee. It's like, no, that's silly because you're making so much exactly. money on a smaller fund like that. 
one and a half percent on 50 million is well just it's not one and a half percent on a billion it's a much smaller That's number it. and so you still have to keep the lights on yeah. exactly exactly and and um and the other thing about big funds right is is the bigger the fund it gets the more that they they tell you what to do I mean, meaning, sure sure right they set up they they set their their criteria and if you want to invest with them great if not well too bad <laughs> well well a smaller fund you really have to sell it yeah well and i was going to build on that i know that a few years ago the the pension real estate association people priya put out a report showing that if you look at the fees that were charged on first time funds and later funds the fees get bigger generally as a percentage you know they get bigger right. and at first glance, you'd think, well, the first time fund should ha be bigger because there's startup costs. And by the second fund, you've already paid for your offices. You already bought a copier like you're set up. So you don't actually if anything, you need less money on the second fund because you don't you don't need to buy furniture a second time. Like you're already I mean, I mean, silly, right. but like you already have an operating business. But <laughs> but generally the funds are like, well, now that I did the first fund that I have a proven track record. I'm going to charge more fees because I'm important and I've done this before and you all want to be part of my thing. So yeah, it, that, exactly. that makes and sense. They have, they have people waiting down the, the road just to invest with them. So sure. they can, they can choose that. That's why the, the first fund or the second fund are the most important because they're typically the most costly, right? They have the more risk because of mm -hmm, the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, these are the ones where you, you know, you, you, you don't sleep well at night. And so you, you, you know, that's, that's, that's where I come in. You know, there's a lot of holding the hand and, and, and really making sure that they actually enjoy the experience because it's the only way to make this a sustainable business. So. Yeah. It's professionalization. And, and I'd imagine too, and it's something I've seen in my own career, not to kind of keep talking about my experience, but at least it's, I've seen in my career and what you're addressing directly is that the. The skill sets that it takes to be good at deals really has nothing to do with the skill sets it takes to raise money. It, it's a different, yes. it's a different personality type. You know, it, yeah. it's 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 just different. <laughs> it's a different I, kind of person. I, 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 and that goes back, Josh, to my analogy on the symphony, R right? Right. Uh, the, right. The person that plays the violin probably doesn't know how to play the piano, and right? that's okay. You and stay. That's okay. And yeah, that's right. okay. And guess what? The, the orchestra, the orchestra director, maybe doesn't know how to play any of it, but but does know how to make sure everyone works in unison, so so everything works out. And that and that's where that's where I come in. Most of my clients already have a team in place, you know. And if not, we, we hire them, and and we hire the best at what what they have to do. But at the end of the day, these guys they don't have the the time or the resources to really manage the fund on a day to day basis. That's that's where I come in. Right. So, and that's, that makes all the sense in the world Fo that there's focus, there's focus. Yeah, exactly. So, so one fun question I always like to ask people, you know, surprises, you've worked on a range of transactions. Uh, sometimes things go better than expected, sometimes worse. Sometimes they're just weird for lack of a better word. Um, <laughs> any fun recent surprises on some of them, the, the fund for the funds you put together. And that could also be, interesting things they were raising money for weird deals i just always like to ask yeah so nothing dramatic i mean thank god right nothing dramatic uh, as far as you know uh things that that uh could get someone in trouble um, sure. you know we, we're you know we are very careful on i'm very careful on on the type of client i work with um i'm very specific and i stick to what i know right which is multifamily. So, so nothing along those lines. However, you know, I have been proposed ideas of trading funds that could be very creative, right? Okay. Right. Uh, and I'll just give you an example. Uh, sure. You know, recently there was there was a fund that um, that wanted to uh, uh, acquire um, office buildings. Okay. Right, uh, to convert into event space. Okay. So, so they will go into you know city centers, and uh, you know this was a couple of years back when the office uh, uh, market right was not doing very well. It was post pandemic; people didn't want to you know they were not back in the office, and you know a lot of companies were deciding to sell at a loss, and so people were trying to figure out well what can we do? You know we buy you know an office building, what can we do? And so they wanted to raise capital to convert that into 
event space. And so, um, you know, my first question was, well, that's not going to work now because people don't want to congregate. Right. Right. COVID. No one wants to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, So, so, so I I assume that's sort of a future type of, you know, a philosophy and and they say, yeah, no, you know, we want to invest now in office buildings while we do the retrofit and we entitle this thing. Maybe by then everyone wants to get back to, to congregating and, and, and everyone is going to be so, uh, you know, happy to see people again that, you know, the event business is going to take off. And so, now I can tell you that that probably could have worked because it is true that now, you know, post pandemic, everyone wants to get back to normal. No, you ticket know, sales of, are up. People are going yeah. to live shows. People a lot of weddings, a lot of weddings that were postponed that are now getting sure. So, so, so that could yeah, have worked. Yeah. But, but then when we underwrote some deals, right? When we look at what it would take to convert an office building into an event operation, uh, which is more of a of a hospitality type of product. I, I couldn't make sense of it. I, I couldn't make sense. It of doesn't it. work. It doesn't work. It, it, yeah. No. It, so yeah. I'm like, you know, the, the idea is great, you know, uh, but I just, I don't think one, this is not for me. Right. Uh, but, but two, I don't think this is for you either. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't make sense. Is it? Well, and that gets back to having a track record of success. I mean, yeah. if you, you know, once you've done something once, um, the joke in consulting always is that people pay you to do the thing that you've done the most. Right. I mean, like that's the whole, which is often then you get bored and it's like the, the better you get at it, the more they want you to do it and the less intellectually interesting it is. Cause then you're like, well, I've done it 20 times already. I I don't want to do it at 21st. Like I want to do something (laughs) different. I want to vary it up a little bit. Now what we I, I, Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Well, I was just going to ask. Um, I mean, you, you have a very interesting niche, which is why I wanted to talk to you. Uh, what were you doing before this? I should have asked that so, at the beginning. Yeah, I was I was raised in the property management and asset management uh, field. So okay. I was yeah, I was I was working for uh, multifamily operators, uh, some okay. very large ones in the industry. And okay. so I would you know, I would do I had huge teams. I, at one point I had uh, just about 100 people. Uh, working with me and uh, I was managing my portfolio was close to 10,000 uh, units, 10,000 apartments. Big. Yeah. So, so, so I've done quite a bit of that. And, 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 and that comes very handy, by the way, when you are building a fund that is focused on multifamily, because at the end of the day, as you know, um, the, the whole key to this is to make sure that your asset uh, goes up in value. Sure. Right. Sure, sure, and in, and for a multifamily product to go up, up in value, we know that you got to uh, uh, have a strategy in place and manage it correctly. And right. if it's not being managed correctly, you got to figure it out. And that's what I've been doing for the past many years in my career. So, and property management is not easy. I mean, it's it's or no. I, you know, I mean, in some ways it's very straightforward stuff, but it's 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 a day in and day out job. It, it's. It, that's just the nature of it. it it's you, true. And, and it's very easy for a property management company to uh, give you a reason that is just not true. Right. Uh, 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 and so, yeah. It's, yeah. And so when, when it comes to it, it's good that you, that you were raised in that field. So that's, that's what I, that's what I used to do. Which makes sense why you stick to multifamily because it's a product type you understand. And so you can quickly, I imagine, size them up and be like, okay, these guys know what they're doing and they probably feel comfortable with you because you understand the product type. Yeah, um, and when we do the underwriting, Josh, it comes really handy because because then I know you know what deals are good, what which ones are not going to work, and and we can move fast. So so sure, that sure, that sure. you know that is very very helpful. No, it's interesting. No, and this is why again why I wanted to talk to you. I mean, the fund management business is curious. So let's talk sort of longer term vision stuff. I mean, you've been doing this for a few years. Uh, what do you want to be doing in two years, four years? Where, where, where do you grow this? Yeah, sure. So, well, two things, right? The idea is to, yeah, to continue grow, to grow the company. I, I don't work with, you know, the, I have a very boutique, uh, uh you know, company. I, I don't want to get bigger. I just want to get better. And, and, um, uh, you know, I don't work with many clients. Uh, I work with only a select few. I sure. want to make sure that they are aligned to, 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 to my vision and that I align to their vision. So on that department, I want to continue to grow steadily. You know, uh, I can bring in a couple more clients at this point, nothing more than that. And, you know, that, that will be just fine. Now, on the on the interesting side, where I would love to be in the next year or two, in addition to this, would be 
for me to get into education. I, 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 I am a, I'm a student at heart. Uh, I have uh, three college degrees from three different countries. I, I love academia. And so I would love to give back to the community. And, and for me to, you know, to, to be able to teach, um, you know, it would be, it would be like a dream come true. Even you want to gear shift into some teaching. I, I no, that's interesting. I always like to ask that question because I never know what I'm going to get. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. As someone who's been an adjunct professor for over two decades, uh, oh, you yeah. definitely, you definitely learn more than they do. Uh, you learn an incredible amount by teaching people. Uh, first, because you have to understand your subject matter to a deep level if you're going to explain it to anyone. And the questions that they give you then make you think about it even more. Uh, they point exactly. out the inconsistencies and incongruities. And, um, and, and, and at the end of the day, I find myself coaching my clients anyway. So I, I'm already teaching. <laughs> it's know? just a, yeah, 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 just in a more formal, in a more exactly. formal way you'd be teaching. Well, that's exactly. interesting. And that's, that's always good to hear. I think talking about how you can, you know, do stuff in the community is always beneficial. And, um, and it's just, that's, just make that's always just nice to hear um yeah. cool well look we talked a little bit about the fund management business and and the process um you know honestly i sort of covered the major topics i guess the only other question i'd have would be from a fund raising management thing over the last few years in which way we're going any major trends you see on the horizon in terms of how we raise money how we manage money like what have you seen over the last few years and also towards where we're going you know it's it's been interesting because i have i i get the feeling that fund you know fund management and raising capital for for funds and creating funds it's becoming trendy <laughs> it's okay. becoming popular i see it you know i see that a lot more people are getting into it um and and to be honest i think the the industry uh, is heading into a you know a more professionalized way of doing things you know people are starting to realize that they need to get educated they need to you know to to set up uh you know their shop a little more professionally and I, and i think um you know as, as me being part of that i i realized that as much as you know social media is playing a big role in raising capital and you know uh you know technology ai and, and all of that is going to have you know huge impact on raising capital at the end of the day it comes down to trust and what I and what I find is that the good old networking, shaking hands, getting to know people works a lot better in the long run when you're raising capital than anything else. Right. You can get really creative on how you do it. You can do, you know, crowdfunding, you know, exploded a few years ago on the Internet. Right. Sure. Uh, and everyone sure. Can, can invest two hundred dollars. Uh, you can get really creative with all sorts of loans, you know, right, right. on a mezzanine loan and the, and the hard money and all of that. But at the end of the day. It comes down to, to trust. So um, that's where I want to stay. And I think that's where, you know, the industry is heading back to, you know, getting to know who's 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 lending you their money. No, and, and I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, it is it is cl kind of cliche, but it's true about relationships. And, you know, and, and I, I'll be honest, I mean, not to talk about myself, but one of the reasons I started doing this podcast was just connecting with people again, you know, in the right. wake of COVID. You know, we all, I think, spent depending on where we lived, we spent a good chunk of our time just sitting in our houses and then you forgot how nice it was to talk to people. Uh, so <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that's, that's why we're here. It's not just to sit on our houses. We are here to see other human beings and do things. Uh, that's just <laughs> exactly the human experience. Right. So exactly. That's good. Right. That's good. Well, look, uh, I'm glad we had the chance to connect. I'm glad we had the chance to go through this. Uh, again, uh, for anyone listening, uh, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, uh, Diego's website is Navio Management. That's N-A-V-I-O management.com. Uh, so you can check him out there. And um, thanks again for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Josh, for taking the time as well. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll stay connected. Great. See you soon. Bye.